Anybody think of any other questions during the break that they just got to answer about those other ones? What we've done is the visions of Daniel and the reign of Belshazzar, he was given more information about these latter times and more, as I like to say, from God's perspective of these great beasts, right? So now we know that. We know what's going to happen. We're going to find out some more things now. And so chapter 9 begins... In the first year, notice this, Darius, the son of the great king, Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So historically, what are we talking about? Remember we talked about Darius the Mede conquered Belshazzar's kingdom in Babylon? That's this guy. Notice he's the son of Ahasuerus. That's the same name that's in Esther. Whether it's the same guy or not, it's hard to know. Which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by visions? No, we understood by books. The number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. We'll go look at Jeremiah the prophet in a little bit. But this is what chapter 9 is about. Daniel is looking at the scroll of Jeremiah and he reads in Jeremiah that something is going to happen. And he knows something about the captivity of his people because Jeremiah prophesied that 70 years would be determined. Okay? In the first year, in the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by books chapter 9, verse 2, the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, to them that keep his commandments. Now, remember I read to you the prayer of Azariah? In the Hebrew, in the thing, listen to this. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Daniel, like Jeremiah and like Azariah, prayed as if all the sins of Israel were their own. They weren't interested in their own righteousness. They were interested in the righteousness of God. And they prayed in intercession for their people. And they called their sins their own. You think Daniel committed all those sins? I don't think so. But he prayed as if they were his sins. He said, Lord, we have sinned corporately. We. And we have committed iniquity and we've done wickedly and we have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But unto us confusion of faces is it this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel that are near, that are afar off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongs confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. I mean, he's, he's repenting. This is repenting. You know, models of repentance. Here's a good one. And he has confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judge us by bringing upon us a great evil for under the whole heaven has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. Jerusalem was cast down. Its walls were broken. The temple destroyed. The might of the kingdom wiped out and the people removed. They just removed them. Took them away. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Moses had prophesied that this day would come. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. 
let me just talk about this principle for a moment. There are many things that God speaks in prophecy that are going to happen, they're going to happen. But let me give you an example. Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, God sends him word by a prophet and judges him and says, you're, you're found wanting, you're going to get wiped out. And what does Ahab do? He tears his clothes, he pours ashes upon his head, he cries out in repentance, but God, oh God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And what does God do? Look at Ahab, how he repents. So he sends the prophet back and says, I'm going to delay it until the time of your children. So what if you were one of those children? Like, how is that fair? What if you were one of those children? You said, Lord, forgive me too. He might have delayed it again. Understand that repentance changes a thing. That God may determine that something's going to happen, and it will. But repentance changes it. Do you know that right now this, there's judgment upon this nation for the sins of this, this nation that we live in? We're, we're the United States of Americans, right? We're, we're this nation. We think we're so wonderful and we're so great and we're so mighty. But the reality is this, there's judgment upon this nation for the sins. But what's going to change the judgment? Repentance. If God's people will hear my voice and they will humble themselves and pray, I will heal them. I will heal their land. How many times has there maybe been judgment that God would have brought, but he delayed it because people repented? There's no set time, I'm just going to tell you, there's no set time at which the catching away and the final times of the end is going to happen. There's, no man knows the day or the hour. We live in the church age and it's time of repentance. We have opportunity to repent and we can see these things delayed. Well, why would it be good to delay them? Maybe we would pray that they would hurry up and happen because we're talking about the people of today. I want to repent. I want to give my heart to the Lord Jesus. I want to say yes to him, and I want everybody around me to do so. Right? And God, for the sake of 50 righteous, would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah. For the sake of 10, he just spared it. How many did he find? He found one. A lot. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked until he took him out because of Abraham. Took him out and then destroyed the city. So understand that this is what Daniel's doing. He understands by books that there's a time that Israel's supposed to come out, 70 years. Well, I will tell you that that is exactly what happened, but it got delayed because the people of Israel did not repent. But that's, we'll get back to that in a minute. But here's, this, this is a model prayer of him crying out to God. Therefore, verse 14, hath the Lord watched upon the evil, brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he does, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, have gotten thee renown, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech you, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and all thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. From the glory of Solomon's kingdom to a reproach. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. By the way, would you call Israel a reproach today? Absolutely. Why? Everybody hates them. They are hated of all nations. They're, they're still a reproach. Just their very existence causes entire people groups to rise up in hatred and vitriol. If that ain't a definition of a reproach, I don't know what it is. When's it going to end? That is the question. When's it going to end? And that's what we're going to see. Verse 18, O God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes, behold our desolations, the city which is called by thy name, for we do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousness, not because we're so good, but for your great mercies. Remember Azariah's cry? Not for our righteousness, Lord, for your great mercies. It's just amazing. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. 
And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Remember earlier on, he was, Gabriel was commanded, help him to understand the vision. He's now come to give him more understanding of what? Of what he read in the books, right? At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. So he, right at the beginning, for thou art greatly beloved, why is he so greatly beloved? Because he stood with his God in everything, no matter what the consequences. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, here it is. On the slide, chapter 9, 70 weeks are determined. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Does that sound familiar at all? That is the final kingdom of God where there will be no more sin. No more. Never again. I mean, it is Im almost impossible for us to imagine a world with no sin, no strife, none. That's, it's incredible. This is the goal. This is God's goal. This is what he is doing. And who is the king of this kingdom? His name is Jesus. He's the prince of righteousness. So, 70 weeks are determined upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to bring reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So the purpose of these 70 weeks that are determined, the purpose of them, it's to do these things, okay? And that's important to understand. Anytime you're going to be told what something is, the purpose of it makes a lot of difference, right? Yeah. Know therefore and understand, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So when was the command to bring, restore Jerusalem. Well, there's a lot of different dates you could use. There was the command that Cyrus the Great gave. There was the reissuing of that command that came later. There were commands to rebuild it given to Nehemiah and to Ezra. So I don't like to argue with people about exactly how many days. This is, when we talk about this, it's 483 years. Seven years plus 62 weeks or seven weeks plus 62 weeks is 69 weeks and 69 times seven is 483 years but if i take cyrus the great's commandment up to the messiah i'm like a 60 years short it doesn't line up so we need to understand something here maybe we got the wrong starting point of when it happened but and maybe i just messed up in my understanding of secular history because that's another thing that could be wrong but the the, the issue is that there's a period of time here somewhere around 483 years. Now, here's the question. Why divide it? Why not just say 69 of those weeks until Messiah the Prince? He divides it. He says 7 and 62. Oh, you mean maybe there's a place where I could put some other stuff in there? Because what he says here is the seven weeks... The wall is going to be rebuilt in troublous times. It says right there, the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. Go read Ezra and Nehemiah. We don't have time to do it today. Go read Ezra and Nehemiah. Every man with a trowel in one hand to put the mortar in the bricks and a sword in the other to defend them against all the people wanting to kill them. Did that go on for exactly 49 years? Well, I'll tell you, some of it did because the Bible tells us it did. There was some period of time in there that's seven weeks. Now, there may have been a, a separation between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks because we know for a surety there's a separation between the 62 weeks and the last one. That separation, we call it in the neighborhood of 2,000 years. So when people tell you that 483 doesn't match up to Cyrus's commandment, yeah, it does. Just put some indeterminate amount of years in between the seven and the 62. Why not? You did it with the 69 and the 70th. 
Why am I telling you all this? Because it's important to understand. People sit and they wrestle the scripture trying to argue, well, the scripture can't be right because we know this. Well, we know that. Or the commandment came in 598 B.C. and 483 years later, Jesus isn't even born yet. Right? Uh, no. You got it wrong. Because the Bible's always right. It's always right. It's always been proven right. So I want to give you and arm you with an understanding that there's seven weeks, there's 49 years where the wall is going to be built in troublous times. There may have been a pause until we begin the 62 weeks. Where is that pause? How much is it? I don't know. You could sit down and start calculating all sorts of possibilities. But this is what's determined. The important thing is to understand the purpose of it. What's the purpose? To bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, who has everlasting righteousness? His name is Jesus. Who brought him forth? The Jews. Where were the Jews? Back in Jerusalem. Who, what kind of people were they? A people who were committed to God. Go read Ezra. Take all your wives that you were not Israel, of Israel and you just put them away. And the children, just put them away. Gather up all your stuff. Leave your jobs. Leave your houses. Leave everything you've gained in these lands. And we're all going back. And then they gathered together and they went back. And then they went there and people tried to stop them. And they had to fight it. And Nehemiah, if you read the beginning of Nehemiah, he's crying out to God, what's going on? He's working in Persia still. Because the Medes and the Persians are still dominant. And he's the cupbearer to the king. It's kind of like Mordecai was. And he's crying out, what's going on, Lord? It's not happening like it's supposed to happen. Like Daniel taught us, it's supposed to happen. It's not happening. And so what does he do? He begins to cry out to God. And God sends him, and he goes and he stirs up the people. He takes his boot and starts kicking them in the rear. I mean, go read Zechariah, go read Malachi, go read Nehemiah. You're going to find out there was no messing around. There was an absolute dividing line. You will stay on this side, and you will not cross over. You know, when you hear the, when you hear the preacher of righteousness begin to declare, you need to follow on to know God, and you need to get it right in your life, that's the kind of stuff went on in these days of Nehemiah and Ezra. They were serious about this stuff. Holiness preachers to the max. Right? You getting that? This is what happened. And it's a great thing to study. It's often just forgotten. People, you know, they know about the story of Moses and they know about a little bit about Judges maybe and Samson, but people don't study Ezra and Nehemiah because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> it is uncomfortable to read it and to see what's going on. And there's a lot of lists and genealogies and whatever, because they're putting Israel back together. Yeah. Israel that had been completely wiped out, removed into captivity, was being put back together. When Ezra finds the books of the law, I mean, there's weeping, and you know, it's just to read it. They, had, they read the entirety of the five books of Moses to everybody standing there, while they read the whole thing. I mean, and just called these people back to a righteousness from their captivity. And those righteous people were righteous enough to, to birth a Joseph and a Mary and a Zechariah and an Elizabeth who then were charged with raising John the Baptist and Jesus. I mean, how would you like to be Joseph? Oh, uh, you get to take the king of the world and raise him. That's amazing. That's, that's incredible. Who were these people? They were righteous people. But even, because, even though they were righteous people, what had happened to them? They had pursued their own righteousness, became so enamored with their righteousness, became prideful about their righteousness that when Jesus showed up, they couldn't receive him. Could we be people like that? Could we stand up thinking that we're the righteous people of God and then get so filled with ourselves that we start, we start getting hurt and upset and unhappy because we think people don't love us like they should and don't care for us like they should and don't treat us with the, the, the honor that we're due? because we're so filled up with pride and we don't even realize it, the, the, the condemnation of the devil and the deception, and we, and we allow that to happen to us. That's what happened to Israel. It had to be broken. You know who broke it? The Spirit of God broke it. Where is that Spirit of God operating? In James the Just, who declared, look, Paul, how many of the Pharisees have believed. I mean, it's incredible. Paul, Paul was a Pharisee. They wanted righteousness, but they going about, as it says in Romans, to seek their own righteousness, did not seek to the righteousness of God. And we hear Daniel crying out, not our righteousness, Lord, but your mercies. 
It's the same message. I think that that's what I'm trying to convey here, is this is the message. And these 70 weeks are determined for a very specific purpose, to seal up the end, to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's the purpose. So the first thing that had to be brought to pass was the Messiah had to come. Moses had prophesied about him. God had talked about him in the garden when he said to, when he said to Eve and he said to the serpent, you will bruise his heel, but he shall bruise your head. He prophesied of the one that was to come. He told Abraham about him, and Abraham said, I see his day. He told Noah and he told Moses and they testified of the Jesus who was to come. They didn't call him that, but of the one who was to come. Moses said that in that day, a prophet like unto me shall come unto him, him you will hear. That's Jesus. So for 62 weeks from whatever time, for 476 years or whatever, there is going to be, or I, I just did that wrong, 62 times Ask my brother. 62 times 7? For what? 434 years from the time when everything got established until the Messiah came. Until he came. And he came. His name is Jesus. And that's why you'll hear Pastor Mark talk about the Essenes and the people. They knew he was coming. They had it all figured out. They knew it was around the time. But see, just like us, they weren't exactly certain of the beginning day. It was 434 years from what date? They weren't sure, but they knew it was, the, it was the right area. We're in the right time, and they were waiting for him. And there were many that rose up. They were there with the Messiah, and they came to nothing. And then Jesus rose up and did the totally unexpected. He died for the whole world. It's just it's amazing. That's what this is about. So we have to understand that. Notice that all the visions we looked at, what is the most emphasized thing by, by God? The great mountain, the great king in the last day and the everlasting righteousness of the great kingdom at the end. That's what God's interested in. Daniel's going, what about that fourth beast? That's, that's wild looking. I want to know more about that. You know, we're like that too. We want to know, we're reading Revelation. They, hey, I like how it comes out. It comes out. God wins. Okay. Right? But everybody's always interested. Was there gonna, it's going to be tanks? Is that the word of the demon locusts anyway? And we get all into this stuff. Look, it's going to be bad. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be awful, and you do not want to be here. So advertisement, rabbit trail advertisement. You don't want to be here. There's something called the catching away. There's going to be a day. Jesus is going to come back for his people. He's going to catch away before the tribulation happens. Anybody tells you different, they're wrong. The Bible makes it very clear. It's coming. There's coming a day. And we are waiting for it. And it's not going to catch us as a thief because we're going to be watching for it every day. I, perhaps today. Lord, Father, take us home now. We're ready to go. In, in all the righteousness of Christ Jesus, Lord, bring us unto yourself. Not because of our righteousness, but because of your mercies. That's what we pray. So that's what this is about. That's what Daniel's going through here. He understood by books that specifically in his day was the, around the time there's supposed to be an end to this. So he's praying earnestly, oh God, oh God, in your mercy, bring the end that you promised. Okay, that's what's happening. You got it? Everybody following? And then something really interesting happens. Oh, and it's one other thing to say. Remember we talked about the Seleucid kingdom and I mentioned Antiochus Epiphanes? That's a long time before this. So I want you to understand that anybody who tries to say that the Seleucid kingdom raised up the Antichrist and it was Antiochus, it doesn't make any sense because all of this had to happen first. Messiah had to come. This is long before Messiah, Antiochus Epiphany raised up his abomination of desolation in the holy place. So no, he was not the Antichrist either more than Napoleon or Hitler or Mussolini or any of all the other many people that have been declared to be. I tell you right now, you don't know who he is because he's not risen yet. Okay? So that's another sidelight. Got excited. So know therefore and understand, verse 25, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, should be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And they're separated. So I, I pounded that to death. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And I said, see Nehemiah. And after three score and two weeks, three score and two weeks of everything being put together that got delayed, because, you know, of the following. That's why Nehemiah had to go from being cupbearer of the king to being butt kicker for Israel. That's really what happened, okay? And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. 
Notice that. He wasn't killed because of his sins. It was testified of the judge. There's no sin in him. He was killed not for himself. He's killed for us. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Wow, that's a quick change. We just testified that Jesus would come and cut off, not for himself. And then there's going to be a rise of prince, that little horn, that horn amongst the ten, that antichrist, that Assyrian, that one who speaks great sayings with a mouth that speaks awful things, that guy? Yeah, he's going to come. He's going to come. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. He's going to make a peace treaty with Israel. He's going to confirm a covenant with them for one week. And he will cease. He will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, she shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's what he's going to come do. So these 70 weeks are determined upon who? Israel. Your people Israel. For what purpose? To bring an end. Israel still has a purpose. And that 70th week is going to happen. So let's go to the next slide. I think it's going to help us. So I put together a quick little table just to help everybody to follow the date part. At the top, you see the captivity of 70 years. This is the one that's testified of in Jeremiah 25. You can go read it yourself sometime. And in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah says that from the time that you go into captivity, there'll be 70 years. So I put a few dates over here. You know, 598 B.C. was, was one date. 586 B.C. another. If you take 70 years, you end up there. If you take 483 years from either one of those, you're nowhere near 33 A.D. That's why I was telling you there's some space. So when, because we get down here, we got seven weeks of 49 years, 62 weeks, 434 years. The walls rebuilt and restored, it's Ezra and Nehemiah. 62 weeks, or 434 years pass, Messiah appears, and he's cut off not for himself. And then this one week, and, this, and the space in between this has been around 2,000 years. The space in between there was probably around 60 years. It was mixed in there. And that's how you get from say 586 to Messiah being cut off in somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 AD give or take a few years I'm not here to argue over the details of that but do you understand what I'm talking about so now you know more than most people about why it is the way it is because people get confused but Cyrus the Persian commanded in 598 and it doesn't work the math doesn't work sure it does it doesn't work when you stick 2,000 years in between 62 and one week either because there are spaces. So is that all you follow? Sure. It should be clear. But these are all the things that are testified of. Daniel understood by books that they were at that time. You can look at those scriptures. You got them with you. Cyrus sets them free, but they don't actually get all the job done. That's where Ezra and Nehemiah come in. Go read it. 62 weeks happen from the time that's all finally completed. 62 weeks happen, Messiah come is cut off, and I will tell you, it's to the day. It's to the day from this, from that 434 years. If you took his death and you went back 434 years, I'll guarantee you that to the day there was some event at which that started. And it may have been when they reinstituted the Passover feast under Ezra and Nehemiah. And then you count 434 years from when they reinstituted the Passover feast, and guess what? On Passover, 434 years, 30, 34 years later, Messiah was cut off on Passover, not for himself. Do you get that? It's just that we don't have it written down in such a way that we can sit and be absolutely 100% certain of exactly when that was. But I'll guarantee you that's the truth of it. If we could find a document that would show it, it would be from Jesus' death at Passover, 434 years back, that's probably when they reinstituted Passover in Israel. But that's just a little bit of supposition on my part. Everybody follow? This chapter is extremely important for understanding Revelation because we know for a fact that 69 weeks have happened. Am I not loud? Am I like, oh. We're not... Uh, 
we know that 69 weeks have already occurred because Messiah came. So we're waiting for the 70th week. What is going to reveal the 70th week? The book of Revelation. It's going to explain the 70th week to us. It's going to help us to understand what happens. Okay? So that's chapter 10, one of the most incredible chapters in the entire Bible. Or chapter 9, I'm sorry. Um, one of the most incredible chapters in the whole Bible that lays out for us the timeline that we have now can look back in history and go, wow, Daniel hit it right. It's exactly what happened. This is what God revealed to him. It had to happen. And Israel was restored. And Israel brought forth the Messiah. Wonder of wonders. Next slide. So then we get to chapter 10. Now we're in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. It's later now. Remember, the Daniel's visions happened under Belshazzar. This is going on with Darius. And now Cyrus the Persian. Cyrus the Great. You know, you can still go and find incredible monuments to Cyrus. The third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed to Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing, and he had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks, 21 days. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all until three whole weeks were fulfilled. You know, you look at this and you think, look at this man. He was so hungry for God and what God revealed, so desperate that nothing mattered to him. Food didn't matter to him. Sleep didn't matter to him. Comfort didn't matter to him. What mattered to him was seeking God. This is how he lived his life. It's just, it's, it's just amazing. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, here's the vision, by the way, just to help you, because a lot of people read it, wait, 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 where's the vision? They're looking for some beast or some whatever. Here's the vision, this is it. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Stay there. Don't leave. I'm going to read something to you. I want you to follow along in Daniel while I read this to you. Uh, let me find it. I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, his white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass as they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. It's the same vision. It's the same vision. Chapter 10 is about this certain man clothed in linen. That's the vision that Daniel sees. It's the same one that John saw and God told him, write the things that you have seen. That's what he saw. The same vision Daniel saw. It links them together perfectly. Who is this? That's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus like he looks in the first chapter of Revelation. Daniel saw him all those years before. 500 years before Daniel saw that same vision. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible. This is the vision that Daniel saw. He says, look, in the third, in third year of Cyrus, I saw this vision, and the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing. And this is what he sees, this incredible person. And I, Daniel, verse 7, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. He just, what happened to John when he saw it? Same thing. I want to see it. It'll happen to me too. You fall down. You can't stand. You have no pride in you. You have no, you have no place of self-exaltation left. There's nothing. You can't. You just can't do it. And behold, verse 10, a hand touched me which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. 
And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I'm come for thy words. He saw the vision, and for 21 days, he cried out to understand it. And it took 21 days for the angel to come. From the first day, he was going to try and plan to come, because we're going to find out what happens. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Gabriel wanted to come, but the angelic ruler over the kingdom of Persia stood in his way and would not allow him to come. He had power. But Michael, lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. They had to spend 21 years, days fighting something we don't understand. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. That's confirmed. Many days. 2,500 days. 2,500 years it's been so far. Well, actually, Jesus looks like that now, I shouldn't say. But it was 500 years at least. It's just that we're still waiting for the final end. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. He, you know, notice Job. I've spoken, I will speak no more. You know, Isaiah, I can't talk. I'm a man of unclean lips dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I mean, it's, it's consistent. Behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then oh, I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O oh, my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have restrained no strength. Who can stand before the Son of Man? Who? Who? For now, for how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? <laughs> how can you even talk to me? For as for me, straight away there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am come forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Wow. Remember, Greece is going to come out and destroy Persia. And I told you that if you look and measure the armies, they never should have won. But see, Michael and Gabriel went and put down the angelic prince of Persia, and suddenly Persia lost its angelic power. And now Greece was going to come and rise. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Just Gabriel and Michael is all that was needed. <laughs> There's enough power. The two worked together and got the job done. But isn't that wild? Now look, I want to say this one more time. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. People miss it. They, 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 there's no beasts and great golden images here. There's the vision of the Son of Man. This whole thing is about Jesus. It's not about the Babylonian kingdom being so great. It's not about, you know, the Grecians or witches that really where the little horn comes from so much. It's about Jesus. Because remember, the end of every vision is that the kingdom of God grinds all the rest of it to powder and rises up and his everlasting kingdom will never pass away. That's that. If you can't get anything else out of it, get that. We win. In fact, Jesus already won. He's here. But there's going to be 70 weeks determined upon Israel for a purpose. And God's purpose is to have a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, where there will be no sin. None, ever. For a thousand years, Jesus will reign and we will reign with him. There will still be sin on the earth. And when it's people sin, they will be judged immediately with a rod of iron. There will be great judgment. But that still is not the end. There will be a kingdom where there just is no sin. Nobody will sin. And that, I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. That's what everything in Daniel is about. That's what we're going for. So can you go to the next slide? So chapter 11 go from that glorious mountaintop experience and we go backwards again. What are we doing? Now he's going back to the first year of Darius the Mede again when, when Belshazzar was first killed. I stood, in, I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Remember I told you Daniel served the kings that he worked with? 
He said, I stood to confirm and strengthen Darius the Mede. <clears throat> That's how this the relationship developed that ended up with the lion's den, remember? So this is kind of out of order, but there's a purpose to it. They had this relationship. He stood up to strengthen Darius, to help him to take Babylon that they just conquered and to administer it. That's why he was made the first of the three presidents. This is, this is, this is a lot contained right there in that first verse about what's going on. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Xerxes. Four kings later. He went and he conquered, tried to conquer Greece. Kept, kept pushing on it. Kept trying. Failed twice. Son failed. They couldn't quite do it. But he was going to make it every attempt to get Greece. And a mighty king shall stand up and rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Who's that? That's Alexander the Great. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. Remember the notable horn, broken off. And shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion. He didn't have any children that took over for him. Okay, he didn't. His generals took over. That's why it says not to his posterity. Notice, notice the detail here. We're getting some serious detail because see now what Daniel's doing is he's talking to the king of Persia and he's telling him about his end. He's telling him about what's going to happen to him and his descendants. What's going to occur. And, and not in his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes and he shall be strong above all and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. The king of the south is Egypt, the Ptolemies. And in the end of the years, they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she will not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and the he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these things. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and deal against them, and shall prevail. All of this happened, by the way. No. It's not. But this is all going on between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. There's a great war. Where are they warring over? The Pleasant Land. They're warring over Israel. And they, they ascend, and the other one ascends, and then this one ascends. And if you go study the history of it, for hundreds of years, this fight's going on. And he's giving great detail. And, you know, if you have a Dake Bible, Dake goes in and he'll take a parallel, a secular history parallel, and show you every one of these things. He'll just show it all to you. It's all right there. And I, I don't have time, I didn't think, to go into the detail of it. But I want you to understand, that's why I put up here, Persia and Greece, he's strengthening Darius the Mede, and he gives a very detailed prophecy, and then we're going to get to verse 40 in a minute. Okay. Into the years that join together, verse 7, out of a branch of a root shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and enter the fortress of the king of the north, deal against them, prevail, shall carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes, with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So at this point, Egypt is ascendant. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and return unto his own land. But his son shall be stirred up and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler and come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and set forth a great multitude. But the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he has taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands. But he shall not be strengthened by it, for the king of the north shall return and set forth a multitude greater than the former. Certainly come after certain riches with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fail. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mountain, Mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So now the king of the north is ascendant. And he that comes against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Remember I told you about the glorious land, right? All this is happening during what? The 483 years. 434 years. The 62 weeks. That's what this is all about saying that during that time, remember the walls are going to be rebuilt in troublous times. We've got that story in Ezra and Nehemiah. Here's the story of the years in between that and when Messiah comes. 
There's going to be striving over the pleasant land by the king of the north, and the king of the south going to be going back and forth and back and forth. There's wars and wars and wars. It's just an incredible thing to read the secular history of it. He shall set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. He shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many. <coughs> but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. All this happened. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province and shall do that which his fathers have not done nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. More wars. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. They shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. He shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. An arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. Take away the daily sacrifice and then place the abomination that makes desolate. Who's that? That's Antiochus Epiphanes. But it's also a type of the Antichrist and what he will do. And that's what I was trying to get to. I was just reading until I got to that scripture. We know that the Seleucid kingdom raised up a king named Antiochus Epiphanes, and he came down and he did that. He did that. It happened. The people of Israel were conquered and scattered, and, but they didn't lose their kingdom. It's important. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all. <clears throat> Who does that sound like? That's Satan. That's, I mean, that's what it sounds like. This is, the, this is the goal. This is where we're heading. We'll talk about it more in a minute. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds <coughs> with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. At the time of the end, verse 40, the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and overflow and pass over, and enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Who are they? Esau and the children of Lot. Okay. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, 
But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make, take, make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. We have switched over from a detailed description of all the things that happened in the Seleucids and the Ptolemies as a type of what's going to happen at the end. And that's what really occurs here. The time of the end, it's all going to be redone. Now here's the interesting thing. Before we get to chapter 12, which is like the most glorious part of the whole book, in a second, well, second most glorious maybe, um, there's a recurrent theme here understand that there's really only two sides in the war. There is God, the Father, Jehovah, and there is Satan, who leads many to follow him, both angels and men. And we know that God wins. We know that, because he's told us. And everything that is happening now is to finish all of that. And the recurring theme is this. Men stood up against God to such a degree that he had to cast a flood upon the earth and save Noah, the only righteous one, and eight souls. We know that after that rose up Nimrod. Nimrod, who, who was mighty hunter, we believe a hunter of men, who went to gather all the people together to make war against God and to interact with the heavenly beings as they had done before the flood. And Nimrod was foiled because God came down and confused the languages. And what we can then trace is that all the peoples of, of that time separated into their various people groups and they went and became kingdoms and they warred with one another as much as they tried to war with God. But what is going to happen in the end is all of these people, all these kings that have risen up the great king of Egypt who stood up before God and defied God, the king of Assyria who conquered uh, Israel, the king of Babylon who thought of himself as the king of kings over all the earth, the kings of Medo-Persia, Cyrus the Great, and all the greatness of that kingdom, the great powerful Grecian host and how they conquered the whole known world, and then the kingdom of Rome that stamped and crushed and did whatever, and it's all going to rise up again, all of that together put into one place to do what? To fight against God. That's really what this chapter is about. There's a lot of detail. It's very detailed, and it's hard to follow. Some woman does this and that, and, and you know, you got to spend a lot of time with it, which we don't have, just that chapter to dig into the history of it. But there's a change that occurs Verse 40, at the time of the end, it's going to all come back. All this striving of the Seleucid kingdom against the Egyptian kingdom, it's all going to come back. It's all going to come back. It's going to happen again. And the angelic princes that it teaches in Revelation will be released again. We believe that the prince of Grecia, the one that, that they fought against the prince of Persia so the prince of Grecia could come, that prince of Grecia that ruled over Alexander the Great will be the prince that rules over the Antichrist. He'll be released to come back and take his place again. And he will take his Antichrist and he will take over the same kingdom he had under Alexander the Great. All of this is meant for, notice he's talking to Darius the Mede. He's strengthening Darius the Mede, saying, hey, you've got a kingdom, but there's going to come a point where your kingdom's going to be overthrown. I want you to understand. So what does it mean to strengthen him? To make him a more powerful king? Yeah, he's going to serve him, but strengthen him means to help him to understand. Listen, buddy, there's a God of gods who rules over men, and he set you up. Just like they taught Nebuchadnezzar, he set you up. I want you to know that the God of gods, he's interested in you. He wants you to know what's going to come to pass so that you will not be so lifted up in pride you think yourself, you know, better and everything. And that's really what he's doing. So he gives him a lot of detail, and what's interesting is all that detail came to pass, but then there becomes this transition where it's almost like double reference. It's talking about how these things that happened are going to happen again, because what Antiochus did, Epiphanes did is going to be done by the Antichrist again. 
and the Antichrist is going to come out of the same kingdom that Antiochus was in. So Antiochus Epiphanes was not the Antichrist, but as John said, there are many Antichrists. There are many who walk in the same spirit of Antichrist, the rebellion against God and his lamb and his kingdom that is to come. There are many who walk in rebellion against God. They refuse. They say, no, I want my sin. I do not want to forsake my sin and come to you. I rebel against your law. I don't, I don't want it, even in the church. I want my sin. I want to maintain it because I do not want to be free of it. I do not want to let it go and come into your kingdom. I want what you've got to give me. I want my inheritance and I want my sin too. And it can't happen. We need to remember these things. And that's what he's telling Darius. Recognize, man. He says, all your descendants are going to do is fight with one another. And war with one another. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to be an ugly mess. And it's just, just people dying everywhere. Wars and rumors of wars and all the things are going to happen. So we follow, everybody follow that? You got it? This is what it's about. It's a hard chapter to read, but we just read it. Right? We didn't talk in the detail of all, you know, who the woman was and who the king was, but I told you basically it's the Seleucids versus the Ptolemies, and that's what happened. Those two kings became the predominant kings out of Alexander's empire. Macedon was weaker, Thrace was weaker. Those two became the one that it's talked about. Well, why? Because it's all talking about the Antichrist is going to come. Where's he come from? The Seleucid kingdom, the Assyrian kingdom, the Nimrod kingdom. They're all the same place. Remember the maps. So go to the next one. This is what I did for the next one. And at that time, <laughs> chapter 12, the, f the final thing in Daniel. This is great. At that time, what time? At the time when the Antichrist is at his peak, right? Shall Michael stand up? The great prince which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to them, even to that same time. So which time is this? Can you flip back a few slides to the, uh, the, the, all the, le the years? Back there. One week. The 70th week. Seven years. So what I'm telling you is, the seven weeks, Ezra and Nehemiah will tell you the detail that you need to know about that. 62 weeks, we just read what goes on during the 62 weeks. There's trials and tribulations. There's wars going all around Israel, and they're standing for righteousness in the middle of it, and they're preserved through it. But Antiochus Epiphanes gets on top of him, and he even comes in and takes over the place and, and defiles the sanctuary. You know, 300 B.C. or whatever, or 200-something B.C., I don't remember anymore. But some part in there. So, now... Chapter 12, we're in that one week, okay? Because that's what he says. There's to be a time of trouble. The, the time is often called Jacob's trouble, Jacob's sorrow. It's, it's, a, it's a rough time. And Pastor Mark did a revelation study. Some of you were here, and he read all the things that are going to happen, and by the time you, you're weeping at just the destruction, the horror, the horror of what is going to be going on on the earth because the hinder of lawlessness will not be here. The church, whether we understand or not, hinders lawlessness. There's still, even in this country, a people who recognize that there's a right and a wrong. Right. That all comes from the church. Right. The only spirit that teaches a right and a wrong is the spirit of God. There's no, there's no, you know, anarchy is the way of the devil. He's happy with that. So when we look at this, at that time, never a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Does that sound like Revelation? And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's the dividing that you see in Revelation. There's those that rise unto life, the first resurrection, and those that arise unto judgment unto death. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I want to be in that number. I want to be in that number. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We've seen that. Right? 
Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two. See, he's being talked to by who? Gabriel, remember? I see another two. The one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? When is this going to happen? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. Notice he said, I saw two, one on one side, one on the other. Who's the man upon the river? Clothed in linen. Remember the vision? It was Jesus, right? Okay. Man clothed in linen, which is upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. Remember, we're back to that three and a half thing, right? And when he shall have accomplished to scatter to the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall the end of these things? He said, Go thy way, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. When was that? The revelation. Here it is. He's asking the question. But, 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 but what is that three and a half? What is that 70th week? What is that seven years? What is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? Peace, Daniel. Your time is over. You've done your job. Seal it up until the time of the end. That's what he tells him. Many shall be purified, made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. How long is that? It's three and a half years. Okay, time and times and a half. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,305 and 30 days. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. In other words, you shall go to sleep or you shall die, you shall pass away, and you will stand in your reward at the end of days. Daniel, you man greatly beloved. So what you hear in this chapter is the final question. What about that 70th week? What about that time of great trouble? What, what, what about it? What about it? What about it? I want to know more about it. No, Daniel. No. That's sealed up for the time of the end. So when was it revealed? The revelation of Christ Jesus that God, the Father, gave to Jesus. You know, he gave, Jesus received from the Father a revelation of Jesus. That's, that's pretty wild. And then he showed it unto John. And John unto the angels or the pastors of the seven churches who then gave it to the people to hear. He passed down this revelation. And we see the explanation, the full explanation of the ten toes, the, the, the clay and the iron mixed together, the little horn of the Antichrist, and that 70th week of Jacob's trouble is all intimately explained in that time. And it's for a time. At that time, it's for a time in the future. And the time and times and a half, the three and a half years, is because there is a big dividing between in the 70th week. There is a half of the 70th week and a second half three and a half years, and three and a half years. And the abomination that makes desolate that is spoken of by what Antiochus Epiphanes does is done in the middle of the week. It's when the covenant that was confirmed of peace with Israel, he breaks it and he comes and conquers them, takes over their, their temple and defiles it and says, I am setting up the worship of Satan and not the worship of God. And that's what he does. And there is, that's when Israel suddenly realizes they're on the wrong side. They get it. And they cry out to God and they are delivered, finally. When are they delivered? When Jesus comes back with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, as Jude said, as Enoch said. Enoch prophesied way, way back that that end would come. So, did you have a question? Yeah, where it says that Daniel saw two, one on one side of mm -hmm. the river, one on the other side of the river, does it, any indication who that is, or is that sealed up? There's no indication who that is. Right. I can tell you what I think. What do you think? What I think is Jesus is standing in the midst of the river, and the Father and the Holy Ghost are with him. That's what I think, <laughs> but I don't know. I just don't know. Remember, in the end analysis, this is all about one thing. Satan 
Lucifer, the deceiver, the liar, started out a rebellion against God in which one-third of the stars of heaven followed him. That rebellion had to be put to an end. And I believe that if Adam had not sinned and he had followed through with what God had done, there still would have been things that occurred that God was going to bring, use Adam and his people to bring forth an establishment of a kingdom in which would only dwell righteousness. But we'll never know what would have happened in that case because Adam joined with the devil in his rebellion. But God, in his mercy, said, I will send a redeemer. I myself will become the redeemer. I will come. And the, and the word came, and he was made flesh, and he became the one who reestablished. Not only did he bring the, the Adamite race back into its purpose, but he will finish the whole thing, and he will be the king of kings. And he, the, the stone that the builder rejected will become the head of the corner, and it will become a great mountain, and it will crush all the kings of this earth, including the final eighth kingdom, which is the kingdom of Satan as expressed in Revelation, where he, his rulership will stand. He will stand on the earth and declare, we will fight against God, and they will gather their army to fight against God, and we will come back with Jesus and end that whole thing. Just like that. And that's the one where you, you read about the blood flowing to the horse's bridles, and you read, I mean, it, you're talking about destruction that we can't even understand. It's going to be so great because it will be a, it will literally be the final battle in a sense of what happens. Um, and Revelation now, if you understand these things in Daniel, if you take the principles of interpretation that we've talked about, you lay out the, the story, you see the history, you recognize the, the confluence of how everything flows around Israel. I mean, he said to Abraham, come, I'm going to take you to a place. And he put him in a place. It's a glorious place. That's where the kingdom will be set up. The mountain of God's kingdom will be in what is now today Israel. Why there? Because God chose that spot. And he and did it early on. And that's the spot. And he's going to have an everlasting kingdom wherein dwells only righteousness. This is the whole the whole point. So that now, if you take this understanding and you go to the book of Revelation, oh, it makes so much sense. What's going on here? He said the books, you know, all that are written in the book, and then you're going to read about the book and what's written in the book. And you're going to read about the judgment of God. And you're going to see the same vision. It ties it together. Daniel saw the vision. He saw Jesus in all of his glory. And then John saw the same vision and reacted the same way. And then began to declare, and he took what Daniel was unable to finish, because God told him, no, not now, wait. He says, because Daniel's goal was to get Israel stirred up to what? The Messiah comes. What, what, is, what is John's goal? To get us to where the Messiah comes back at the end of the 70th week, right? I mean, it all ties together beautifully. And that's what Revelation is, answers the question. So we are at the end. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. That's a lot to get through. You guys are amazing to sit through all of that. Does anybody have any other questions? Hopefully, when you go to the Revelation study next week, maybe? No, two weeks. I think Pastor Mark's doing another Revelation study. It'll mean a lot more to you. You'll be able to follow certain things. And some of the things he's talked about beforehand will make more sense to you. Okay? No other questions? Then we're, we're done. Go. Thank you. Thank you. We love you.